folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. As I previously reviewed Beethoven, the surprising smash family comedy hits about a lovable, troublesome, you know, slobbering and drooling, making a mess of things, but nevertheless a, a family dog. That's a St. Bernard who actually wins everyone's hearts. Starting with the sequel, Beethoven's second. This time, Beethoven falls in love with a beautiful female St. Bernard, and together they brought in four St. Bernard puppies to take care of before they're being stolen by a ruthless uh, girl and her boyfriend, yeah, Regina and Floyd because of the divorce custody that's going around with um, her ex-husband. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of course, um, Beethoven is now a family dog and joins in with the Newton family. And and I, I guess I forgot to mention a few things uh, just to get ahead of it, was that Gene Siskel actually did love the film. You know, he was amazed of, of the enjoyment it turned out to be, and he loves a dog. Loved the way the story flows, and even if it's predictable and cliche at times, and a lot of slapstick that throws in. And plus, he was amazed to see Dean Jones playing an incredible villain. Yeah, creepy too. Yeah. Because you know, this guy's always up to no good with all these latest experiments that he's doing. You know, torturing these uh, poor animals, particularly dogs, and you know, even fools um, the family by thinking that Beethoven actually attacked his arm, but there was no bites whatsoever. I mean, this guy completely sick, and he had to hire these thieves to to steal him. That sort of thing, yeah. But nevertheless, I mean, the family cares for Beethoven, and they hope that. You know, they'll get used to it. Well, George will get used to it. And he did. So, anyway. This was uh, at the time when we were getting holiday sequels in 1993. Uh, starting in November with uh, Robocop Free and Look Who's Talking Now. Yeah, both based on their franchises that were very popular. Yeah, unfortunately they were both bad. Incredibly bad. I had to see uh, Robocop Free in theaters, and I totally regret it. But hey, I love Robocop, so I, I had to take my chances. And uh, Luke Who's Talking Now was later. But hey, I always loved the Luke Who's Talking movies. Um, then we have Adam's Family with their sequel, Adam's Family Values, which Surprisingly, turned out to be better than the original, but I still love both of them together. And I always loved it completely when I saw it in theaters as a kid. Then it follows with uh, Wayne's World, with the sequel Wayne's World 2. I saw the film later on, but I didn't see it in theaters. Um, but I did enjoy the sequel. It's, I mean, it does have its flaws, but I still think it's better than nothing, you know. But it still was fun, even though the original film was way better, you know. But I love both. <laughs> okay, okay. And then, of course, there's Sister Act with their sequel, Sister Act 2, Back in the Habit. Terrible sequel. Unnecessary. Didn't need to be made at all. It just felt more forced. It feels almost like I'm watching another um, Dead Poet Society Blending in with um, with uh, the choirs, you know, they're taking yeah. Where this time, Sister Mary Clarence decided to take uh, the entire um, high school class and turn them into a musical choir. But it was a film that introduces to Lauren Hill and, and I believe um, some of the other actors um, were fam became well known later on too, including. I think Jennifer Love Hewer was in this too. Yeah. Bad. But of course, Beethoven was 
is one of them to join in with the, the group. So I was even surprised that we were going to get a sequel. But I was happy because um, after the, the film came out on TV on Fox and I taped it before and then and before I lost the tape. Yeah, I forgot to mention I lost the tape and then I had to record it again but this time on on a DVD-R through uh, Stars and Uncore, I believe. Uh, before I got the DVD at Dollar Tree. And I hope someday I'll find the Blu-ray if I can. I just wish they could release this movie on Blu-ray to have a better transfer. Because even looking back at the, the DVD, uh, I noticed it, it doesn't look uh, as... Um, I mean, it's sharp, but it doesn't look... But it does have its um, issues, because I think they put it directly from a rough 35 millimeter print so so there's some rough edges you know with so many um, you know dirt grain and all that in, in the mix so it, it was a little problematic but I guess it, it flows better as the film proceeds but that's not exactly how I saw when when I saw in theaters at the General Cinema in Glendale California yeah we had a General Cinema here it was a five-screen uh, theater that was right next to McDonald's. And yeah, I, I talked about this before because I went to see the re-release of The Little Mermaid at the time. But I did want to see this in THX Sound. Um, it was at the time when I went to see um, so all these other holiday films that come out also, like The Three Musketeers, for instance, from Disney. You know, the one with, it, with Charlie Sheen. Uh, Chris O'Donnell, Oliver Platt, who was in Beethoven, <laughs> and um, Kiefer Sullivan. So it's sort of like the young guns for <laughs> for Musketeers. Um, but I went to see this um, during the Christmas vacation, or perhaps it was the start before Christmas vacation, because um, the following day, it was my last day of school, so I finally got to be on vacation before I was going to get ready for Christmas and not only that but would be able to see another film to, to come out the holiday season that was Batman Mass of the Phantasm <laughs> and I was getting all the presents too the same goes with my brother Jason and Eileen too which she was only a year old and yeah this is where I, I actually got a BCR for the first time that year and and so I was getting VHS tapes, I was even getting some movies like The Muppet Christmas Carol and uh, as well as uh, Home Alone 2 Lost in New York and then I was getting all these other one of those uh, mega blocks and all this uh, other clothes and stuff so that's what I was getting on Christmas for, for my family that was wow it was amazing and it was also the time when I had cable too because <laughs> I was taping Nickelodeon and other movies and shows and stuff on any channel. Yeah. Okay, I know. Um, but I saw this movie uh, with my uncle Louie, along with Jason. So because you know we loved the first movie, so we wanted to see the sequel. Especially me, because you know I love this this movie so much, and um, we had a good time. Well, my mom and my dad went to go see uh, the Pelican Brief because it came out um, in theaters but I, I, I didn't want to see it because I was too young I wasn't so sure if this thriller would, <laughs> would do me any good so I, I just wanted to get into watching family films for now but hey I was only eight years old at the time okay so I wasn't wasn't ready yet <laughs> I mean I know I have went to see R-rated films at a younger age too okay <laughs> maybe I was just trying to get into what I'm Getting into. <laughs> and by the way, it's a great film too. Okay, I know, I know, I'm getting ahead. So let's start with the review, with the sequel, and this is the last film to feature the Newton family. By the way, because that's where we get to the direct-to-video sequels, and it's the final film to feature the original Beethoven, played by Chris, uh, the Saint Bernard dog, because he was used for for that alone. And unfortunately, they couldn't use him in the later ones because he was getting older. And also to note that, um, speaking of Chris, that uh, this was also the time when um, 
Chris was actually uh, part of the uh, the stage show for uh, Universal Studios Hollywood too. So it was cool that uh, he got to um, be part of it since Beethoven was such a popular franchise. Yeah. So okay, <laughs> uh, with that side, so let's uh, begin. Stars Charles Grodin, Bonnie Hunt, Nicole Tom, Christopher Castell, Sarah Rose Carr, Debbie Massar. Uh, yes, she's friends of uh, pop singer Madonna. But yeah, she appeared in, in some of her videos. And believe it or not, uh, she was actually a dog lover herself. I mean, considering that she's playing an evil character. So this is the opposite. <laughs> And it's also true because, from what I heard, uh, she actually adopted some of the puppies from this film. So I, I love how um, we get to see that she really is a dog lover, and she really cares. Uh, Chris Penn, yeah, the late great Chris Penn, uh, who happened to be Sean Penn's his brother, uh, who's been best known for films like Reservoir Dogs, for instance. Interesting. <laughs> But that's the first Quentin Tarantino film, as we know. But he was also in uh, other films as well. He was in Footloose. He was in um, another another film that was uh, written by Quentin Tarantino, but directed by Tony Scott, uh, True Romance. And and then later he was in Rush Hour. Yeah, Rush Hour with Jackie Chan and Chris Tucker. Awesome. Yeah. He'll sadly be missed, though. He was a great actor. Ashley Hamilton, who later went on to do films like Iron Man Free, hard to believe, that was him. And I think he went on to do films like Lost in Africa. That was in 1994, the following year. This was his first film, too. Uh, Danny Masterson, yes, this was his first screen debut. Before he went on to do the TV show Sybil. That was on CBS uh, with Silver Shepherd. I, I saw that show. It was actually very funny, very cool. Um, and then later on, he went on to play, as we all know, Hyde from the TV show That 70s Show. <laughs> awesome. He's recently in the new show called The Ranch, which is on Netflix, which has Ashton Kutcher in it, too. Yes, former star. So it's great to hear what he's been doing. Catherine uh, Reitman, and I think she might be related to Ivan. Uh, Moe Chalkin, uh, Heather McComb, Scott Wara, Jeff Corey, Virginia Captors, and Kevin Dunn in, in an uncredited role, but he was given you know, two minutes of screen time. We also noticed that um, uh, Danny's uh, younger brother, uh, Christopher, actually joins in in the movie, but he was only there for like maybe a few scenes. So, so he's in there. It's written by Len Blum, um, which is based on the characters by John Hughes under his name acronym of Edmond Dantes and Amy Holden Jones. And it's directed by Rod Daniel, yeah, taken over for Brian Levant. It's the same director who gave us films like uh, Teen Wolf with Michael J. Fox. Yeah. His most uh, popular comedy that he ever had. Among other films, he, he passed away recently, um, a few years ago, I believe. And that's sad. But he always will be remembered. The movie began set in a Newton family home, where we meet George, Alice, Rice, Ted, and Emily, all played by Charles Grodin, Bonnie Hunt, Nicole, Tom... Christopher Castell and Sarah Wells Carr and Beethoven, played by Chris, the St. Bernard. They're actually doing so well in their home, you know, adjusting and living together, which Beethoven was just having a dream about that, <laughs> you know, the family is about to give him some nice food, like, for example, a giant uh, steak or... <laughs> Or any other. Um, anyway, fortunately, you know they were all busy. I mean, George is actually planning an interview to sell his uh, car air fresheners uh, from his business law firm that he has. 
um, to uh, First Interstate Bank. I mean, he's preparing for it, but unfortunately, the paper boy shows up and throws a newspaper at him and threw a cup of coffee and, and it spilled over him, so he had to change his entire uh, shirt so he'll look well. Yeah, I mean, the paper boy, as you may saw in the original film, yes, he did throw uh, the newspaper at him, but it went over the place. So, <laughs> this one's like a Dennis the Menace type, so it's basically him. This happened twice, too. <laughs> or, this rate just, yes, uh, first and second. <laughs> Where this time, uh, uh, George was trying to capture the, the newspaper, but then it hits the... Uh, the pottery all the from the roof and just fell on on him okay so um and George was joining in with Alice to see how the product was sell so. meanwhile Rice Ted and Emily are just you know going to school trying to deal with their own situations uh, meanwhile Beethoven sneaks out and meets a beautiful female St. Bernard named Missy and joining in with her owner Brillo who's played by Kevin Dunn who's actually giving them uh, strawberry ice cream yeah even though he was gonna get some too but he said but he figured he'll just buy it out so why not <laughs> but then we meet an evil future ex-wife of his Regina played by Debbie Massar, who's joining in with her boyfriend Floyd, played by Chris Penn, who takes Missy and seeking a $50,000 settlement of alimony by retaining full custody against uh, Missy and only plans to transfer to Brillo once the divorce is finalized. So Brillo is all alone, and Beethoven decided to help. Uh, get uh, Missy out of the Regina's uh, condominium which they had to left her outside and yep they begin falling in love with each other by exploring around at Valley Vista California by going to certain places you know they had some hot dogs and you know they're just looking around and and it was just love at first sight um then Rice uh, Son, um, later on, Rice had developed some strong feelings uh, for her classmates. We never found out what happened to uh, her first love that she had a crush on. But this time, it's a boyfriend named Taylor Deverox, who's played by Ashley Hamilton. Because um, they went on a date for a while after he kissed her. So hoping that you know they'll be able to see each other more often but look no further though he's up to no good uh, Ted and Emily on the other hand were becoming very aware of Beethoven's constantly sneaking out of the house so eventually they followed him around only to discover that they got four puppies to join you know with Missy and so they were taking good care of them at the basement of Regina's uh, condominium uh, that's where janitor Gus uh, informs Regina and Floyd just to find where Missy is at because they're trying to look for her. Um, so what they did was they took Missy and um, she would claim to have plans to get rid of the puppies even if it means killing them. Yeah, She's basically an evil... Crow the Vill type, or perhaps it might be her sister. I know, I know. I, I always, the, the mind speaks. <laughs> so it almost has a bit of a 101 Dalmatians feel here, but except it's not 15 puppies, it's just four. <laughs> and it's not 101 either. <laughs> okay. So, of course, Gus uh, talked them out of it and pointed out that those puppies are worth a lot of money. You know, those purebred puppies of St. Bernard's that they could suggest to sell them at a local pet store. But 
both uh, Ted and Emily thought that by the time they overheard what they were going to do, because they're thinking that Regina is going to actually drown them, they decided to sneak them out of the building with the puppies to take them home with each other. Um, so they can take good care of them. I mean, while Emily was trying to fool um, George, you know, his, yeah, her father, hope, telling them where do babies come from. <laughs> so they just put them straight to the basement, you know, before their father begins to find out later on. But they don't want to be able to know about that till then. So for the past uh, uh, 10 weeks, I believe, or perhaps it could be, you know, two months, uh, both, I mean, all three of them, uh, Rice, Ted, and Emily, decided to take good care of those puppies by feeding them uh, at midnight, like at 3 o'clock in the morning, before they had to go back to bed. But unfortunately, they were getting very tired. You know, they, they've been sort of missing out a bit. You know, they've been falling asleep at class. So that's what they've been doing. Um, they had to keep a secret before the parents suddenly sees it. But at that point on, you know, Alice receives a phone call from Rice's... Um, a chemistry teacher I believe or a science teacher and that's when Bryce tells the truth by saying that yes they've been taking good care of the puppies and they're hoping that if it's a right to keep them for right now and Alice just found out about it and then that's where well they're trying to keep a secret away from George uh, even though George was just talking about you know business deals and stuff or talking about uh, actually going to um, to camp out at a lakefront house that he was planning on so for the entire um, for one of George's business associates you know they were gonna plan on staying there for like maybe a couple days or so you know just to have fun you know get away from it all um, but then suddenly George uh, overheard some dog barking and that's when he begins to find out by going down to the basement to know that, yes, the four puppies are there. But he tells them, we can't keep these puppies because they're going to cause a lot of trouble. But, yeah, those puppies are going to wreak havoc. And it's going to, you know, destroying the entire house is going to drive me out of my mind. <laughs> so, Rice had uh, informed him that, well, we were kids before. I mean, how did we act it? Did we want to get rid of them? No. So, um, it's better not to do that because, you know, it'd be a problem. And also because we learned about what's going on with Regina and, and Floyd because they're going to go after them. So, that, so it's only their protection before they become mature that they'll be ready to be taken um, by Missy. If, um, if they'd be able to find her, too. So the Newton family are offered a free stay at the lakefront house at the mountains um, that's owned by one of George's business associates, of course, um, joining in. Yeah, meanwhile, they're trying to take good care of the puppies very well, you know, taking, giving them baths. You know, that's where you hear the song, uh, Jim Olsen's Blues by the Spin Doctors. <laughs> Which kind of sounds uh, almost like the song, or Two Prince. So it has a bit of that, but it, it worked pretty well for this movie. I mean, especially when we saw the scene where where one of the puppies uh, was riding on a skateboard, and, and suddenly uh, the trash can hits just when the trash truck was arriving, and the puppy flew all the way up in the air and landed straight into <laughs> uh, the, the trash can for... Um, you know, for all the uh, the grasses and everything. So, puppy was safe. Or, another scene where uh, George was about to grab the other puppy, but wants up <laughs> getting sprayed by the uh, the cleaning machine that goes straight into the pavements. So, anyway, I mean, they've been trying to take uh, great care of them already. You know, they're feeding him more dog food and all this other stuff, so... It was getting better, and then next thing you know, they're about to head off 
to the mountains so that way they you know they have time for themselves so the whole family are just um, already you know having fun you know they're going to several places you know they they stayed around at at a cavern uh, that's near the dock so they're just you know having fun um, while Beethoven is just going around you know searching here and there um, that's where um, Rice suddenly was about to attend at a party uh, where Taylor is actually um, hosting along with her friends uh, we actually Rice actually meets um, another guy by the name of Seth who's played by Danny Masterson yeah he goes around riding a motorcycle Seth just came in to um, ride around with Rice to see where Taylor's at and yep Taylor was at the docks with his uh, girlfriends or basically friends you know just hanging around just you know swimming and jumping out of the dock and you know that's sort of fun well that's what led to this uh, mildly disturbing scene too was that when Rice was attended at a party with uh, Taylor's friends and I know this this had a controversy too well especially for Cisco and Ebert <laughs> um, it was a scene where Rice was just about to uh, go up to the cavern um, where the um, all the guys and gals were hanging around uh, Taylor just invited her to go up on on top of the the room. Meanwhile, um, Rice had put Beethoven um, locking his leash into um, by connecting it through the the patio deck. Yeah, where suddenly, and this is where we get the animal cool to here, where a bunch of guys started pouring beer at Beethoven, having them drink all the beer. And they kept pouring it all the way while Taylor just locked the door of the room and was about to, and just for a brief second, was ready to rape her. And I know, it, it's hard to believe that this was going to happen until suddenly Beethoven came to the rescue by, by running as fast as he can and took out it stripped out all the patio deck all the friends fell all the way down into the dock and it stripped off the house and suddenly Taylor actually froze from the roof and just fell all the way down and that's where you hear the utter William scream sound you know the one that you heard in, in movies like or TV shows like Serial Mom and All Real Monsters and even another stakeout of sorts you know <laughs> you know that sound <laughs> I just mimic it <laughs> but by the end of it though um, Rice actually says hey Taylor great party thanks Beethoven <laughs> so now you know Beethoven is uh, her hero and Taylor just are already in the river and was ready to drown himself in the in full embarrassment <laughs> yeah that was pretty messed up so hey I mean it removes her from potential danger that was gonna happen to her the next day we follow Regina and Floyd because they're actually staying over at another dock uh, at another cavern um, being unknown to Brillo, they constantly went near the, the Newton family uh, at their vacation home. Yes, uh, which is the cavern, of course, I just mentioned. That's where, they go to a country, that's where they go to a county fair with the dogs, and the children suddenly persuaded George to enter a burger-eating contest. Yeah, he was going around just eating uh, some nachos and other foods that he just got because he wants to sit there alone eating them so he's very hungry <laughs> um, also uh, there's a moment where uh, where uh, Ted was actually uh, was getting to know uh, another girl yeah so he's starting to fall in love with um, 
by owning her a Coke. So they'll, they'll get in touch. But then the, um, her brother, tall brother, started to I mean, pick on her, and that's where Ted was ready to actually show Beethoven how to do these tricks so that way he could attack him. So, saved her life here. <laughs> Um, yeah, and his older brother joins him with, a, or I think it was his cousins or so, I don't know. Um, so anyway, uh, George entered the burger eating contest uh, with Beethoven. It was only three minutes ahead. You, it joins him with, uh, the, um, the founder of, of this fair, well, the, he was hosted by, um, by one man, uh, played by, uh, William Schollert, who is no longer with us. Um, so they won. I mean, they had to, at first they were eating pretty slowly, but then next thing you know, they had to keep eating as fast as they could, you know, trying to beat these guys, and finally they, they won, and, but George was ready to throw up, and he did. He went uh, straight to the, the local porta potty and then suddenly Regina and Floyd were also at the fair and was ready to leave Missy in the car all alone and they were ready to take um, the puppies you know with uh, Ted and, and Emily enough for them to actually warn them that they stole them and of course Beethoven came along and was ready to take Missy out of the car and they're about to chase after those puppies so that way they'd be safe from Missy and you know, from uh, Regina and um, Floyd. So of course, because this is part of her revenge. Um. So then the Newton fam. So George, along with Alice and Rice, joins in together, so they'll be able to find where they are. Yeah, they had to go exploring to find out where the tracks are. Yeah, in fact, the puppy suddenly uh, pees on, well, one of the puppies actually pees on Regina and uh, <laughs> Floyd just when they fell all the way down from the bridge. Uh, then they, they had to go all the way. Uh, they had to find their tracks. Apparently they found some poop. Um, they couldn't touch it except for rice and just to see if it's warm, to, hoping that they'll be able to find them because they did poop uh, and yes George tell them to wash it off after <laughs> so now they they finally found uh, the puppies uh, with uh, Beethoven and Missy just as uh, Regina and Floyd were, were there and you know unfortunately with Floyd actually falling all the way down into a stump and then Regina had to take the stump out of him and and he, she fell off too, and that's what led to a fight um, between George, the, the rest of his family, the Newtons, and Regina and Floyd. Till suddenly they wound up falling all the way down from a cliff, all the way straight to um, the mud, and then they directly go straight into the water, uh, the wrapping rivers. And by the end of it, though, because they were going to pick them up and they refused to help. <laughs> Just as that turned out to be, yeah, this is a funny scene. Was when Alice says, is anybody hungry? <laughs> yeah, I, I know. They're, they're, already, um, they're already in the Rapping Rivers. I mean, they're almost nearly killed over there. Or they're about to. And she's saying to them, are you hungry? <laughs> Is everybody hungry? I mean, come on, man. <laughs> okay, I know. It sounds cruel. But five months later, but five months later, uh, just when um, George was having a bad dream where he dreamed that all these puppies uh, came along and started destroying the entire house, and it's not just four puppies, but it suddenly spreads into zillions of them. So we're getting into the 101 Dalmatian territory there. <laughs> So yeah, he was woken up, and that's where Seth came along and and actually invited uh, 
he, he wanted to have uh, Rice join in on by borrowing his father's Jeep. So that way they can drive around together as a date. And not only that, but Brillo had business the Newtons with Missy, revealing that the judge in the divorce uh, had granted full custody um, by denying the Regina's claim. So now he finally gets to keep um, Missy and the puppies to join. And that's where the puppies themselves became much older. They ran downstairs to see Missy, and yes, the film ends this way. While you hear the song, Roll Over Beethoven by Paul Schaefer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In my opinion, the best sequel of the Beethoven franchise, without a doubt. Actually, not just my opinion. I think everybody would agree that this is the, the only good sequel we ever got. Kind of like what Home Alone had suffered too. But this one at least sets up on its own. Um, the cast was excellent, as usual. I mean, it's great to see how this, this goes along. I mean, George at least, you know, changed his ways in the first film. And even though he did felt a little grumpy at first, but he's already getting ahead of himself. And at least he finally gets to stop against... Um, you know, Regina and Floyd, as, after he found out about what was happening to the puppies. So he was getting used to the puppies. So that was the case. And yeah, plus, you know, he was just hanging around with Alice, you know, having the, some fun and at their vacation house and stuff. And then it sets up with the stories of other children, you know, going for their, their situations here, you know, with, with Rice, you know, dealing with uh, her boyfriend. Before he gets to know, uh, before he gets to meet uh, Seth, which to me, Seth is the best choice, and I'm glad she's now with uh, him instead of uh, Taylor, because they broke up. And while um, Ted was trying to get to know this uh, girl, as I mentioned, while Emily is just, uh, well, just trying to see how things are going, just joining in together to see you know where Beethoven is is going around you know, yeah they're taking Beethoven with, with them and you know, just have having fun at the fair and you know, playing all these games and all and uh, <laughs> I guess that's just pretty much what what's going on here um, but it's very funny very hilarious um, love the locations that they got um, because it is shot in California, some of it was Pasadena, uh, but the rest was actually shot in, in Montana at the Glacier National Park, so I figured that's what they had to do. I mean, they thought maybe this was California at first, but... As we all know, yes, uh, Devin Massar did um, adopt uh, one of the puppy, or I think two, I think, and then, um, I think it was one of them, but... Um, even uh, Chris Penn actually adopted uh, one of them too. So it's really cool. I mean, knowing that in real life, you know, they actually love dogs and they care for them. <laughs> uh, also, for the soundtrack, um, probably the most uh, famous song of them all was the song called The Day I Fall in Love, uh, which is performed by a duet of James Ingram, you know, God Rest His Soul. And he joins in with Dolly Parton, yeah, the uh, country music singer and actress. It was actually nominated for a Cammy Award for that song, as well as a Golden Globe and even a Grammy Award for Best Song of a Motion Picture. Um, I'm not so sh I don't think it didn't win, but it was a beautiful song. It really works as a love theme for Beethoven's Second. Uh, between the Beethoven and and Missy, as well as uh, well Rice and Taylor, or it could be Seth. <laughs> um, it was actually nice to see Danny Masterson in his earlier role. I mean, he definitely was very kind. Cares more about her. I guess we now know because they're both sitcom stars. <laughs> okay. Um. And 
the the moment too where they were just watching a uh, a romantic film at, at the drive-in. I mean, that's where Beethoven brings in the popcorn to Missy, and, and they're all eating. <laughs> that that was a sweet moment too, while the song is playing. And yes, they did use a lot of uh, stunts. Um, had some doubles here for for the puppies as well as uh, the Saint Bernard. After the film, it was actually surprisingly. Um, more successful than ever before. It actually grossed uh, 118 uh, worldwide upon its um, December 17 release and I was happy to hear that it did so well but unfortunately this was the last film to feature them and it's a shame because you know we're not going to be able to see them again because now we're going to go for the direct video sequels that follow. Such a shame. Um, that's too bad though. But you know what? I think it ended better with the first two and, and, and rightly so. It works so well. Got a nice score once again by Randy Elderman, their producer um, Ira Reitman, uh, joining in with Michael C. Gross and Joe Mediuk. And Rod Daniels' direction, I mean taking over for uh, Brian Levant, uh, did an amazing job show a lot of exploring here and there. As for Regina, yeah, she was very uh, cruel, um, evil, very nasty. She looks like a guy, too. Uh, yes, even Uncle Louie uh, thinks so, too. Um, but she's a great actress, anyway, Debbie Massar. She went on to do other stuff that I, I saw her in. Um, but she definitely has that uh, spunky voice of hers. Um, and same goes with Floyd. I mean, he was very evil, too. Um, very bumbling type. But the fact that he had to get into these days. <laughs> but, hey. Um, but he still, Pam was a great actor. And it's just sad that that uh, Sean Penn's brother is no longer with us. But he will be remembered. So it's a very sweet, uh, romantic, but fun family comedy. Even if you had to do with the cruelty and, and the and that disturbing scene, well, mildly disturbing scene that we got, but other than that though, I still think it's a, a great film. A good sequel. So that's uh, Beethoven's second, and I give the movie um, four and a half stars because of the the unnecessary uh, scenes that I've mentioned. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.